We want to welcome you who are watching by television to Word of Life Church, home of the Mission Cathedral, where people find freedom and victory in Christ. Since it is vacation time, I thought you might appreciate this vacation joke. A couple decided to go to Cyprus for the weekend, but because they, they both worked, it was hard to coordinate their itineraries. So to this, they decided the husband would go a day early and his wife would join him the following day. Well, on arriving, the husband thought he would email his wife from his laptop, but he accidentally mistyped her email address and sent it off to a widow. A widow had just returned for her from her husband's funeral. He was, he was a minister for many years who had been called home to glory. Well, the widow checked her email and expecting to get messages from her relatives and friends, but instead she found this message. To my loving wife from your departed husband. Subject, I've arrived. I've just arrived and have checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. Sure is hot down here. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> all right, how many of you all brought your Bibles? Lift them up real high. Make Jesus glad and the devil mad. Say this. Say, this is my Bible. It is the Word of God. I believe in it from Genesis to Revelation. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And I have what it says I have. I boldly declare that my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and my cell phone is off. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Did you hear that, devil? I will never, ever, ever be the same in Jesus' name. Now turn to someone right next to you, look him straight in the eye and say, aren't you glad it's not hot down here? God bless you all. You all look wonderful today, if you would. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And now, Heavenly Father, as we embark on this new series on the order of faith, I pray, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of all the people here, those watching by television and online, that they will be truly blessed and encouraged through this word and directed by this word. We honor you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we read the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I want to speak to you all right now. The word that comes to my mind is frustration. A lot of people are frustrated with their Christian walk. They're especially frustrated with the fact that their faith in God doesn't seem to be working. They don't seem to get the promised results that the Bible tells them that their faith should be producing. They still struggle with their sin habits. They, they can't seem to break free from these addictions. Others can't seem to receive the health and healing that God's promised. Others are struggling to pay their bills when they know the Bible says that God will supply their needs. Others have desires that they really would like to see, and they know Psalm 20, verse 4, where it says, God will grant you your, the desires of your heart. How many of you all know that? But a lot of people are frustrated because they're not getting their, 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 their hearts granted. They're frustrated financially. They're frustrated in their marriages. They've went to marriage retreats, and instead of getting better, they're getting worse. They're praying for their children, and instead of their children turning to the Lord, they seem to be departing more into the world. They're just struggling. And I know I'm talking to somebody right now who's struggling in their faith walk. You want to know what's going on? And on top of that, the devil then tells you, you know, it's just not going to work. You know, sister so-and-so tried that stuff, and did it work for her? No. You know, a lot of times we get discouraged because we're focusing even on other people's failures. When it doesn't work for them, you say, well, that couple went through marriage counseling, and, and yet they still got a divorce. They went to this marriage workshop. It still didn't work for them. When is it going to work for me? When am I going to see the results of my faith? Well, first and foremost, do not get your mind on other people. Yeah, don't, don't, don't be focusing on that pastor's wife who didn't get healed and say, well, if she had strong faith and she didn't get healed, I won't. First of all, our relationship with God is a personal relationship. 
It's not based on what someone's experienced or what they didn't experience. It's between me and God. That's why Romans chapter 14 says, each of us must give an account before God. I like that phrase, each of us. That means we're not going to bring our lawyers. How many of y'all know you can bring your lawyers to a judge, but when it comes to God's judgment day, you don't get to bring your lawyer. You don't get to plead the fifth. It's a different, you don't get to bring other people and say, God, the reason why I didn't really trust you is, let me show you, sister so-and-so, she trusted you and didn't receive. You can't make excuses and say, sister so-and-so didn't get blessed. It didn't work for her. So that's why I chose not to even try. You don't get your eyes on people. Galatians 6 verse 4 is clear. It says, do not compare yourself with others. Oh, I tell you, it's a dangerous thing to compare yourself. Two bad things will happen when you compare yourself. Number one, you could become prideful, or number two, you could become jealous. You know, you compare yourself to others. Well, you know, I have more money than they. I'm better looking than they are. I have a better spouse. I, I live in a better country. I, I'm better, and you could get prideful. Or you can look and say, oh, my God, I look ugly compared to him. Oh, man, they have more money than me. They're more prosperous. They have a bigger ministry. Oh, and you can get jealous. God tells us, don't be comparing yourself to others. So I've learned something. My faith with God is personal. I fully expect to receive every promise fulfilled in my life that God has said. And I don't look to my right or my left to see if so-and-so got the promise received, fulfilled. It doesn't matter. I'm going to receive from God because I'm not going to compare myself with others. See, on the flip side, we can also try to compare ourselves with others on a positive way. For example, anybody heard of George Mueller? George Mueller was a great missionary. He, he started an orphanage uh, that ended up serving through his lifetime hundreds of thousands of children. This orphanage is called, called Ashley, um, and it was successful. He, he went there just to do that. But God spoke to him and said, I'm going to supply your needs and this, the needs of these children, but don't ask anyone for help. So George Mueller obeyed God, said, I'm not going to ask anyone for help, and he fully trusted God. There was times when the children would say, um, sir, what are we going to eat? And George Mueller said, God will supply. And every time something would happen, a knock on the door, he'd open up, there was some bread, some eggs, God supplied. But he, he never asked anyone for any money. He never asked anyone for help. Well, now some people have looked at George Mueller and said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a ministry and I'm not going to send any appeal letters. I'm not going to send any emails. I'm not going to even put a donation uh, for my internet, if somebody wants to help us, God will do it. Well, friend, that's what God told George Mueller to do. Don't try to live comparing your faith with someone else. One minister tried to do that, and he fell on his face. Finally, he cried out to God and said, God, I'm trying to do what George Mueller did. I'm not asking for money. I'm not appealing for anybody. But yet, you're not meeting my needs like you did George Mueller. You know, how, you know what God said to him? You know why? Because you're not George Mueller. He said, I spoke to my servant Mueller to do what I, I told him to do, not to you. So I've learned through the years, as, as much as people can inspire me with their faith, I realize my walk with God is personal. That's why we call it a personal relationship. I don't have a relationship with God and with people mixing in that relationship. Don't misunderstand me. I have a relationship with people, but between me and God, it, it's, it, it's us. It's not between me, God, and my wife. It's just me and God. And I recognize I do, I'm going to trust God and not worry about other things. A year, years ago, when Jerry Savelle was learning from Brother Copeland the life of faith, he got real excited. Jerry Savelle owned his own body shop, uh, fixed cars and all that. But when he really, God started calling him in the ministry and told him for the next three months, 
I don't want you working on cars. I want you dedicating yourself to the word. Get in the word, hear every single teaching you could possibly hear, go to every meeting, shut yourself up, don't read the newspaper, don't watch TV, just read the Bible, read Christian literature, and that's it. For three months he did that. But Jerry Savelle did tell the Lord, but Lord, I'm married. I have two girls to take care of. God said, I'll take care of them. I'll meet your need. And during those three months, people were generous. They were giving to him. They blessed him. And for those three months, it was as if he had a job. Well, what ended up happening is a few Bible school students heard what Jerry Savelle did. So they dropped out of their jobs. They quit the jobs and said, you know what? We're going to dedicate ourselves to the college, to Bible school, and we're going to learn the word, and God will give us the money for our tuition. Well, what ended up happening is they didn't get the money for the tuition. So the Bible school couldn't even pay the teachers, the professors. Finally, the, the, the dean brought the students in and says, what's the problem? And they said, well, you know, you brought Jerry Savelle. He talked about his story. And we, we decided to drop out of school, uh, 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 of jobs to meet, to meet our need. But he explained, listen, that was what God told Jerry Savelle. You're trying to compare yourself to him. I'm going to tell you, that's one of the biggest mistakes we can make in life. We start comparing ourselves to others. I've had people pressure me. You know, Kenneth Copeland, he doesn't borrow any money. Well, that's Kenneth Copeland. But that doesn't mean I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to trust God on my level of faith and where he directs me to go. Do you understand that? So I'm following the Lord because it's a personal relationship. Well, even though our relationship with God is personal, there are similar, I should say this, the same principles that George Mueller had to live by, that Jerry Savelle had to live by, that that pastor in Houston had to live by, that we have to live by. So there are similar principles we have to live by. So the question then becomes, all right, Bishop, I, I want my faith in God to really work and produce good fruit. Where am I missing it? H how can I get, get my faith working right then? if I'm not supposed to imitate every single person. Well, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there's a statement here in verse 33 that I want you to notice. Verse 33, for God is not a God of, what does it say? Disorder, but of peace. So what is God a God of? What's the opposite of disorder? Order. So if God is not a God of disorder, then what is God? He's a God of order. So we have to understand, number one, he's a God of order. You say, okay, that, that's fine. How, do, how does that apply to me? But notice, if he's a God of order and he made us in his image, then we are to be people of order. He applies this in verse 40. Notice verse 40. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way so notice this he says now God is orderly now you be orderly so we can't look at God and say well he's order but I'm chaos no 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 if he's orderly I have to be orderly so notice he makes the application since God is orderly when you have church services you must be orderly in your services you cannot be disorderly. You cannot be in chaos. You can't just do what you want. There has to be order because God is orderly. Do you get this? Since he's orderly, I must be orderly. You say, okay, that's fine in a church service, but how does that apply to my faith? L listen to Colossians 2.5 in the King James Version. Paul says, I am with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, notice that phrase. I'm beholding your what? Order and the steadfastness of your faith. Now, most of us understand faith must be steadfast. But he also says order. Your faith has to be orderly too. It's not just steadfast faith, but orderly faith. You, are, are you with me? I've learned that people, faith is not too orderly they 
they're desperate. They try all sorts of gimmicks, all sorts of things to move the hand of God. Oh, God, I promise you, I'm going to take my wife out every week if you give me this new Corvette. You know, where's the orderly behind it? Now, we're being humorous, but that's the way people do with God is they, they believe in him, but their whole faith is disorderly. So they're trying all sorts of things. Well, I, I gave $1,000 to this minister on TV because God was going to bring me a breakthrough. It didn't happen. I came to church and, 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 and I, I came forward for prayer and the bishop laid hands on me. I know he's an exorcist, but, you know, he didn't exercise anything from me. I'm still demonized, you know. It didn't work for me. I, I, I tried this. I went to this meeting over here and I gave God a try over here. And then I tried over here and I tried this stuff over here and it didn't work. And I, and I tried this over here and it didn't work. I'm trying everything. Well, why don't you start getting orderly? Because that's the problem. There's no order. Now, when we speak of order, what does order mean? Order simply means there is a sequence and steps that we make to get from A to Z. There's sequence, steps. Let's look at the first action of God when it came to order. How did God show order when he made the worlds, the universe, right? So the first way God showed his orderliness was through creation. Now, how did he make creation? Read the Genesis account. It's very fascinating because we find that God begins with chaos until the whole world is in order. But to get to from chaos, what is chaos? Darkness was over the face of the earth. That's chaos. But how does he get to us in an orderly universe? You'll find there are steps to take. We call it six days of creation. Why six? Why didn't he just do it in one day? God is teaching us there were steps. There was a progression that even God had to make to get from darkness to mankind. And it wasn't done by leaping over day one, two, three, four, five, and just get right to six. Because if he just decided out of darkness, I'm going to make man in darkness, what would happen to man if there was darkness? We would not survive. Because the world would not have been a place where we can have inhabit. So he had to start with light be. The first was to start eradicating chaos to give order to the universe. So light, energy, was the first product. And then we find God says, let, let the waters be gathered in the sky and on the earth. What is he doing now? We're creating an atmosphere over the earth. There's no point for me to bring forth fruit and plants if there's not an atmosphere protecting the plants. So there we find the ozone layers are being produced in the second creation day. Why? Because if we don't have an atmosphere, what good is putting animals that would die, plants that would die? So he starts creating an atmosphere. The expanses, the sky and the earth. You're getting this. And then he's separating waters from the land. Earth needs water, needs land. But from it, then we find plants growing see what's the it's not the animals first what's the point of putting animals but give them no food to eat you have to give plants and fruit so that the creatures would be able to eat something so we find plant fruit is the next day then we find the fish where's the first life form not on the earth but in the waters waters of course is the best place for anything to grow it, that's why in the seas, there's more life forms in the sea than on the land. Because water is a great producer of life. So it's not a su surprise that the first life forms are in the sea. Then the birds of the air. And then you find the land animals coming. But the land animals have to come first before man. You see, there's a seek. And then at the crown of creation... God then makes man to think, to talk, to communicate, and he makes man 
after he does everything. Do you see? He couldn't put man first until he created an atmosphere. He couldn't create an atmosphere until he got the sun and the moon in the right distances to the planet uh, Earth. Because if it's too close, it's going to burn up. It has to be per Do you see? Everything is in sequence. Now, I'm giving you all of this to show there was day one that led to day two that led to day three. Or we can say it this way. God started with step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, step six. You see, even God went in progression. He went in sequence. Your faith must have sequence to it. And that's the problem. We haven't really followed step one to our faith, to step two, to step three. And we're going to cover in the next few weeks ten sequential steps of the order of faith, how faith works. Because I want to get you from your problem to the solution. Of course, life is, is, is orderly. I... I like to cook. And in the cookbook, they will tell you, you know, the media, you'll see numbers on a cookbook. One through five. Step number one, get the product, right? Step number two, here's how you do it. Here's number three, here's how. If you're going to be a good cook, you can't skip number one and jump to number five because you're in a hurry. How many of y'all are in a hurry? I'm in a hurry. Bless God, I, I, I'm getting old, Pastor Brown. I need to believe God for a husband, and I need it quick. I'm in a hurry. Well, stop, stop. be patient. Let's start with number one. No, I don't got time for that. I'm in a hurry. See, you're already missing out on God's blessing because you're impatient. Start with one. All right. You got to go back to the beginning. So if I was cooking a meal and I, and I jumped number one, two, and three and started number four and then went back to number one and then jumped to number six and then went through number three, I promise you, you won't enjoy the meal. I say, what is this? Well, I was just led of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> just, just being led, just being moved. Hallelujah. Whatever God had me to, to make, I just pulled it out. Hallelujah. What kind of life is that? We're charismatics, but man, that's another group of chaotic believers sometimes. Is, you know, they, they go from the real rigid, denominational way of doing things to it's the Holy Ghost, whatever God leads me to do, whatever scripture he gives me to give, I'm ready to do whatever he has for, I'm, I'm flowing. But there has to be order. For example, Prayer is coming to the throne of God. How many of you all believe in the throne of God? Notice prayer is called coming to his throne. Who sits on a throne? A king does. Kings in ancient days were not only the executive branch, but they were also the judicial branch. The kings were also the judges. You find that in Solomon. You, you, you know, when people had a need, they went to the king and he acted as a judge for them. See? So... When you go to a judge, like right now, if you went to a judge and you needed, you know, a judgment in your favor, do you show up at any time? Do you walk up and, and the bailiff says, excuse me, what are you doing here? I want to talk to the judge. Really? Um, let me see. Where's your name on the docket? I'm sorry. I'm just coming here because I'm being led of the Holy Ghost right now. Well, you know what? The Holy Ghost didn't lead you because there's a procedure if you want to talk to the judge. These are the steps you have to, to have. You understand? And they will explain to you the steps. If you don't have a lawyer, fine. You don't need a lawyer, but we recommend one because a lawyer will be a good mediator. How many of y'all know we have the best mediator? Jesus Christ. But it doesn't mean that our mediator tells us to be disorderly. He says, be in order. Here's the way you approach God. There are steps to make. And if you are not getting answers to your prayer, maybe because your faith is disorderly. You don't want to follow the, se se the sequence of steps necessary to get from your problem to the answer.